thank you everyone for being here. Um, and let me just say at the outset, this is the uh, uh, first event in a new partnership between the Atlantic and the National Constitution Center, Jeff Rosen, and it's uh, going wonderfully well. Um, helped a little bit by the news, perhaps. Um, but we're looking forward to a long and, uh, and fruitful relationship. Um, Congressman Schiff, uh, how's your week been? Um, slow. Slow. Yeah. Slow. slow. Imagine um, it fast. Uh, so can you just bring us up to speed? Um, I, I want to get to some larger issues about uh, the stress on uh, the Constitution, stress on our systems, uh, and, and the various issues that impeachment uh, raises, but, but why don't we talk for a minute about uh, one of the latest developments, the uh, release to you at least of the whistleblower complaint. Um, you have now seen the actual whistleblower report. Um, I, did it surprise you? Can you say anything about it um, to this group about what you've, um, what you've understood about it so far? Well, I don't know that I'm authorized tonight and uh, this may change uh, first thing in the morning. Um, we can wait. Can you wait? <laughs> the conversation goes on long enough. We'll I'm just able to bring in you. snacks. Uh, it's fine. Um, I don't know that I can even confirm or deny whether the subject of the complaint involves the subject of the call. Uh, because the at this point, the director has made no declaration that any of it is unclassified or any of it can be shared. Uh, presumably, when he's coming in to testify, he's going to want to be able to um, talk about some of the substance. Right. Uh, but frankly, they're not going to tell us until the morning uh, what they consider classified or unclassified. Uh, I should say, frankly, that this complaint we consider to be the property of our committee. That's where it was intended to be. Uh, and we ought to make the decisions about the release of information from it. Um, frankly. We have much more concern, I think, over the welfare of this whistleblower than anyone in the administration has shown. Um, and I don't think you know the they have the... the whistleblower? Do you know I the don't. identity of the whistleblower? I don't. Okay. When, will, when will you find out? Or will you find out? Well, uh, presumably I'll find out uh, before he or she comes to testify. Well, and hopes. we're trying to uh, arrange that uh, as soon as we can. And, but here's the challenge and the danger facing the whistleblower, which is... The acting director of national intelligence says, I'm determined to protect the whistleblower. Well, I, I appreciate that sentiment, but where were you when the president was suggesting the whistleblower may be a traitor? Um, remaining mute in the face of that, to me, does not seem like protecting the whistleblower from reprisal because the reprisals have already begun. Uh, but more than that, the Department of Justice wrote what I consider a sham of a legal document to justify the non-transmittal of that complaint to Congress. But the way the Justice Department did it by saying in this contorted legal reasoning um, that the Director of National Intelligence has no responsibilities when it comes to protecting against foreign interference in our election, that should come as a revelation to the Director. Uh, it certainly came as a revelation to me. Um, and. But by using that basis, saying this is outside of the director's jurisdiction, basically the Department of Justice has said, whistleblower, you're outside of the protections of the statute. You're not covered. You're at peril. Um, and so we want to make sure that we do everything to protect that person. Hmm. Um, and it may be to protect it from a Justice Department that is now run by someone who views his mission as serving the interests of the president, not the interests of justice. Right. Let's talk about your reaction to the transcript, so-called. It's not, a, not actually a word-for-word -word transcript um, memorandum of the call, the call that is still at the center of this, of this controversy. Um, tell, us, tell us what you think about it. The, the, the White House released it in the hopes that um, it would allay people's fears or show them that it's uh, less than, than meets the eye. We now ha are hearing from many Republicans uh, privately that they're appalled that the White House released it uh, because it is so damaging in their eyes, at least privately. They won't, they won't say that publicly. Talk about, talk about the, the, the content of, of, of that and talk about your reaction to it. Well, uh, you know, when the White House announced and they sort of vacillated about this in the last couple of days that they were going to release the transcript to Congress, 
we started, not transcript even, although they called it a transcript, but they were going to something to Congress. Um, we started to wonder whether what they were going to re release was a selective excerpt of this conversation. That is, as I understand how the process works, there could be many people on a call between the president and a foreign head of state. Many people separately taking notes that get written up as a report of the call, uh, and that maybe what the White House was going to do, a la the misleading bar summary, right. is cherry pick the one that contains the least incriminating information about the president. Because as I understand, not necessarily the policy, but sometimes the practice, those that are writing up the notes of the call don't want to include things that are just embarrassing to the president. Um, and and that may extend to things that are beyond embarrassing that could go into illegality right. or corruption. Right. These are people who work for the president. They're people who work for the president. Um, so I have to say I had low expectations for what they were going to actually release. Uh, I got a chuckle out of uh, a news story, although it's kind of dark humor, uh, that came out today that was a press report of overhearing two White House staff talking to each other saying, um, won't it be embarrassing if what we release doesn't even include the part of the conversations the president has admitted to? Um, <laughs> and I mean, it's, at one level, it's funny. At another level, it's, it's terrifying. Um, that's when very it, Alice when it, in Wonderland. Oh, yes, that's, that's extremely rabbit hole yeah. When it came out, I was shocked at how bad it was, how blatant it was. Um, and I can only think that either they were just so terribly misled by the president's own sense that he can persuade anybody of any uh, alternate reality, that right they have their alternate facts, truth isn't truth, and they could spin this into any meaning they want. Either they had fully bought into that, or they were convinced somebody else had this record, somebody else was going to release this record, and better that they do it early, because the one advantage they had in the course of the Mueller investigation is the facts came out drip by drip by drip by drip. If the facts we knew at the end of the Mueller investigation were released on a single day. If we learned about that illicit meeting in Trump Tower and those emails where the Russians literally promised dirt on Trump's opponent uh, as part of the Russian government after to help the Trump campaign, it would have had a completely different reaction for the country. So I, I, don't, I don't know what it is, but obviously um, I think people's reaction to it, and now you're actually starting to see some of the Republicans in the Senate speak right. out publicly. Um, it's hard to imagine um, a worse abuse of office than this. And, and this is, of course, what the framers Go here. into that. Go into what is the, it will come to that in a minute, but what, what is specifically the most blatant um, violation of, of, of the law, perhaps, and certainly presidential norms and beha norms of behavior? Well, you know, the, uh, the first obligation of the president is to protect the country. That, I think, means quite literally protect the country. It also means uphold the Constitution. That's part of the oath. It's really the, the essence of the oath of office. And here the president betrays both. Um, it's in our national security interest that Russia not invade its neighbors. It's in our national security interest that when we promise Ukraine, as we and our other allies did when they gave up their nuclear weapons, that we will help assure their territorial integrity, that we stand up for what we promised. Um, and here, that a president of the United States would withhold military aid to a nation that is still occupied in part by Russian forces, Russian irregulars, little Russian green men, withhold that um, even as he is pressing that leader to intervene, to manufacture dirt to help his political campaign. Um, it makes our country less safe. It jeopardizes our national security. But in terms of his oath of office of, of faithfully executing the laws, we passed a law that said we want this, these millions of dollars in military assistance to go to Ukraine. He's not faithfully executing if he's withholding that support for personal political reasons. So uh, to me, it, it, it is the most flagrant abuse of his oath of office. Right. I asked um, the speaker uh, yesterday if she believed that the president understands right from wrong. Do you believe the president understands right from wrong? Um, not always, no. I don't believe he does. Um, because there are some times when he will say, <clears throat> say things and, and 
This is a president who deceives all the time. <clears throat> but sometimes he will say things that are so damning, I think because he doesn't understand how truly incriminating they are, which suggests that there are times when he doesn't know right from wrong. Or his view of the world is everybody is completely in it for themselves. That's how he operates. That's how he expects everyone else to operate. And for anyone <clears throat> to suggest otherwise is a charade. Right. Um, you know, you, you meet people in life who assume that everyone is like they are. And when they lack a moral compass, they assume everyone else lacks a moral compass. You know, I would still imagine that somewhere in the back of his head he understands right from wrong. But that switch doesn't always seem to be flipped on. Um, or even when it is, it's always secondary to his immediate personal need. I, I asked that question because he, he, this phone call happened right after the Mueller, right after Mueller's testimony. Um, he's not unaware of the fact that you're not supposed to ask foreign leaders to interfere in American elections. Uh, it's been discussed in public <laughs> for quite a while now. And yet he did this. And so uh, it strikes me as not Nixonian. I think Nixon understood right from wrong and did wrong sometimes or often. Uh, but but I, this, this question goes to the question of whether he's competent to be president, and I want to ask you that directly. Do you think he has the cognitive abilities? Put aside the, 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 the moral compass. Does he have the cognitive abilities, in your mind, to be president of the United States? I, d I don't think he has the, uh, the character to be president of the United States. And I've often said, and, and I don't mean it as an exaggeration, that you could pluck someone off the street and they'd be a better president. And I say that because if you pluck somebody off the street at random, they would be patriotic, they would be decent, and they would have the common sense to know that if they didn't know someone something, they should find someone who did. These are qualities all lacking in the president. And, um, but I think what has our republic really shaking right now is not that the president lacks these, the, the, the essential uh, element of character, but rather that my GOP colleagues are so willing to fall in line no matter how serious the depravity. Uh, you know, we had a, a resolution on the floor today to um, urge the complaint to be provided to the Congress. Uh, you know, this would be laughable if it wasn't so serious. Yesterday, when we took it up on the Rules Committee, um, the Republican representative of the Intel Committee said it's premature. Um, we shouldn't ask for the complaint until the director comes in and tells us why he's not giving it to us. And then today, he argued it's post-mature, because now they've agreed to provide it. So it's premature, post-mature, it's apparently never mature <laughs> for Congress to insist that the law be obeyed. Um, and when I listen to my colleagues just tie themselves into knots to explain how this obvious shakedown on this call was some, somehow nothing to see there, right. you know, I was reminded once again, as we've been reminded over the last two and a half years, that there is no depth to which they will not go to avoid being tweeted at by the president, uh, attacked by his cronies uh, on Fox Oh, you can testify that you can get tweeted at the president and survive. Yes, in fact, I have to tell you, because I thought this was quite hilarious, I didn't get a chance to watch the president's press conference today, so I, I missed that show. Um, but one of my staff came in right after it was over, and he said, the president just called you smart. Um, and I said, really? And he said, yeah, but then he said, you lie and lie and lie. And I was like, you kind of buried the lead there. Right. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, you know, I can attest the fact you can be attacked by the president, you can survive it. And I, obviously it's different as a Democrat, but a great many of my Republican colleagues could stand up to this president and their constituents would applaud them for it. Uh, I remember a conversation I had actually at a forum I think that you and I participated in when Senator McCain and I were backstage. Oh. This was before the midterms. And I said, I don't understand why there's not a single Republican in the House who feels they have a constituency to be the, be the John McCain of the House. I would think that's a good place for any number of my GOP colleagues to be. And his response was, well, if it stays that way, they'll soon be calling you chairman. Um, 
And obviously it did. Um, and, you know, while I'm glad that I'm the chairman and not the ranking member, um, I would prefer that my Republican colleagues did the right thing. Um, and while I understand at a very kind of pedestrian level why they don't, they, they're worried about a primary, they're worried about their future career plans, at another level I don't understand at all. What's, what's the point of their being there? Well, I mean, you know, I mean, obviously, you you know many of your Republican colleagues fairly well. You're probably friends with some of them, um, and, and I want to just press on this point. You know, you read the you read the transcript, as it's been called, um, and it is not it is not. Um, I will not give you money unless you dig up this dirt and send it to me in this post office box. It's a little bit more vague, at least in the description. Is there any possibility that someone could? read what you've read in a slightly more benign manner and give the president the benefit of the doubt? Uh, it depends, I guess, on what you're drinking or smoking. Um, I don't know how you can read that. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how any of them could read that. And if they didn't know there was an R next to the president's name instead of a D, um, that they could reach any conclusion other than this man is corrupt. You said it reads like a, a mob shakedown. Go into that a bit. Uh, it does. And, you know, I'm, I'm continually reminded of something James Comey said a year or two ago about how when he was asked by the president, uh, can't you see fit to let this Flynn thing go? He didn't need to be told this was a directive. When the commander in chief says that he hopes something happens, it means I want you to make it so. Um, that the president speaks in Comey's experience like an organized crime figure. Now, I've got my issues with James Comey, but not on this score. Because time and time again, we see this is exactly how the president talks. Uh, Michael Cohen talked about it as well, how the president would talk in code. And you read that call record, it's got everything you'd expect from a mob boss. It's got, um, you know, we do a lot for you. We do a lot for you. We do more for you than any other country does for you. But there's not much reciprocity here. Um, there's not much reciprocity, and uh, I got a favor I want to ask of you. Um, and let me just say, Ukraine's a nice country. Um, it's kind of like, it'd be sad if something happened to it. Like, like nobody defended you from Russia invading your soil. Uh, you don't need to club the president of Ukraine over the head. The president of Ukraine goes into that call knowing I am totally dependent on this country against a powerful and malignant neighbor. Um, I'm dependent militarily. I'm dependent diplomatically. I'm dependent economically. Um, his, his court gesture of a lawyer has made it clear what he wants even before this meeting. Um, my staff has certainly told me exactly what the president wants. And the president makes, wastes no time in getting to the point um, and goes back to it and back to it and back to it. Um, Ukraine is not stupid and neither are we. Um, it's clear what's going on here. And uh, if you're going to look for the president or anyone else to spell it out in graphic terms like I think any good organized crime figure they know how to talk in a way where the message is clear and the threat is implied. Is he, um, is he Michael Corleone or is he Fredo? <laughs> <laughs> I always no. thought Don Jr. was a dead ringer for Fredo. Um, but uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I, I, uh... Michael wouldn't get caught with a transcript. That's all I'm saying. You know, I, I mean, it, I guess these days you have to laugh or you'd go mad. But this is a terrible tragedy for the country. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned John McCain earlier, and um, I had the chance to travel with him uh, to a couple of security, national security conferences. And at one of them, um, and the wonderful thing about traveling with him is he could invite anyone to dinner and they'd come. We had dinner with Bono and Bill Gates. and. <laughs> Um, as the night wore on, uh, we started telling jokes, and Bono told a joke about being Irish, and then got very serious, and he said, I'm very proud 
to be Irish. I'm very proud of Ireland, but Ireland, like most countries, is just a country. America is also an idea. And I remember thinking at the time that this is really what's at stake right now, the idea of America. But, but I thought a lot about that conversation over the last two years. And, and for much of those two years, I thought about that conversation in the context of the idea of America as the bastion of democracy, as the champion of human rights, uh, as, the, as the torch for freedom-loving people all around the world. But I've come to realize there's another part of the American idea that is also now so deeply at risk. And that's the idea of America as a melting pot, uh, the idea of America as a place that's welcoming of refugees, uh, that, um, that you can come to, that you can belong in. Um, and when the president tells my colleagues to go back to where they came from and inspires crowds to make that hideous chant, you realize, Everything about the American idea is at risk right now, and that I don't think uh, you can capture well in a uh, in a movie role. Right. So my last my last question for you is a large question. But you know, as a representative of Hollywood, I always appreciate the opportunity oh. to cast people. Exactly, exactly. The um, the large question, maybe it's the largest question, is: Is this a political crisis, a moral crisis, or is it a constitutional crisis? We're here to talk about the Constitution. Is the Constitution, constitutional norms, constitutional uh, behavior, is, it, are we, is this under threat in some way? The, the subject that is the preoccupation of the National Constitution Center, of a lot of people in Washington and beyond. Well, I think it's really all three. It's certainly a moral crisis uh, when so much of the, the values of the country are being tested. Uh, what does the country stand for? What, do we still stand for what it says on the Statue of Liberty, or, or are we some different country now? So morally, we're being tested. Politically, um, our system is showing enormous um, strain. Lots of things we thought were inviolate norms turn out you can violate with near impunity. Um, whether we're in a constitutional crisis, I've always thought that we'll be in that crisis when the courts finally adjudicate against the Trump administration vis-a-vis uh, -vis the oversight we're doing. And Donald Trump says what I think President Jackson said once before when the Supreme Court ruled against him, well, that's your opinion, now let's see you enforce it. If we ever get to that point, we are in a full-blown crisis because there is no one and nowhere to appeal. Um, I don't think we're there yet, but I do think, well, the framers um, conceived that a, a man like Donald Trump might become president, I think they had more confidence in the Congress and its willingness to, when the Constitution itself was at stake, overlook party interests and do what was right. And in that respect, they may have overestimated. Well, let me, let me follow that up with a final question because you, you're, you're, you're forcing me to ask this question. Do you, if the president ever said, to the Supreme Court, to a Supreme Court ruling. Well, that's your opinion, go enforce it. How much faith do you have that your Republican colleagues in the House would say, okay, that's the red line. Thank you very much. This, is, this whole thing is over. And how, much, and how much faith do you have that they would do that? Or do you doubt whether people would rise to that? It's very difficult for me to see the circumstances in which um, this current crop of representatives is willing to stand up to the president. Um, I think what we've learned uh, is the flip side of something we knew, and that is we knew that courage was contagious. During the presidency of Donald Trump, we've learned that so is cowardice. Um, and there's a kind of a group think going on um, where if no one speaks out, no one speaks out. Uh, and no one was, is speaking out with any conviction right now in the GOP. Um, and therefore, no one is speaking out. And, you know, after time after time where we thought, okay, surely now, uh, only to be disappointed, I've given up any expectation of that changing. But, you know, I do want to say, so that we don't end on such a gloomy note, I also have every confidence we're going to get through this. I think the country's been through far worse. Um, we've been through 
far greater uh, times of division, and nothing was worse than the Civil War. Um, but even Vietnam, I think, were far more profound divisions and far more deadly divisions than today. Um, so we're going to get through this. Um, there are certain things that will be an indelible blight even when we do get through it. Uh, what we've done to these migrant families uh, will be, I think, the darkest stain um, on our country. Um, some damage can't be mitigated. A, a, a family, a parent that has lost their child, um, whose child has died, is never going to get that child back. And, but I do believe that when we have a new president, they can quickly mitigate much of the damage. And the size of the repudiation at the polls next year is going to be very important uh, in telling the rest of the country um, whether this was a bout of momentary insanity or something far more serious. Um, and maybe more importantly, in telling ourselves, in reminding ourselves uh, that the country is much better than this, um, that this president, this presidency, these collective failures in Congress, um, that we're better than this, and we're going to demand better in the future. Congressman Schiff, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.